Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great, uh, great day to uh, talk about security. Of course, every day is a great day to talk about security. I think it's uh, one of the number one uh, pillars, if you will, in our IT portfolio. And uh, no question, uh, today we're we're going to be, uh, I think, really uh, interested in, in hearing from Jonathan and uh, what Attack IQ is all about. You know, I, I've had a, a great career in in dealing with uh, IT as a CIO or CTO over the last 30 years. You know, I have the privilege in the last five years uh, really serving as an interim CIO or CTO or helping companies with their IT strategy and, and IT technology. And certainly in uh, 2021, we're looking at all kinds of new avenues for the bad guys to come at us. Uh, you know, certainly there's, uh, there's more, more money to be had out in data. So data being protected and the, the edges of the network now growing. And of course, now we're moving this hybrid uh, model for coming back to work. So there are all kinds of really interesting things are happening. So in my business, uh, in, in, you know, representing the peer group of IT and CIOs, uh, CTOs out there, it's just a great, great time to be, you know, in this business. And that being said, um, it's really great today, Jonathan, to be joined by you. And, and by the way, I, I know that uh, the la your last name is Ryber, and coincidentally, right, you're, uh, you're rhyming there with cyber. Uh, again, you know, great to have you here. You know, just super impressed what uh, Attack IQ has got, you know, going in the product and services in the market. Uh, really love to hear from you just a little bit, uh, if you can start us up with, uh, like, who are you guys? Like, what, you know, what, tell us a little bit about the company, maybe a little bit more about yourself, you know, amazing background that you've had, uh, very, very impressive. Uh, you know, so a little bit maybe about you, about the company and where you guys are going. Uh, and then, you know, sure. we can launch into some, some dialogue and, uh, you know, some Q&A back and forth. And so, uh, yeah, over to you. Let's, uh, let's hear a little bit about what you guys are all about. Great, thanks, Rob. Thanks for everyone for joining. You can hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming in clear. Good. Super. Um, it's a pleasure to join you. I, um, I've been at Attack IQ now for over a year, I think. I just celebrated my year anniversary. Um, I joined on April 1st, which um, is like obviously two weeks after the start of the pandemic. And it's been an incredible experience. Um, I couldn't have picked a better company to join in such a strange moment in human history. Um, because the, the quality of the leadership team. So um, we we're, we're are what Gartner, Gartner came up with a term for what we do. Uh, we didn't come up with it, Gartner did, called breach and attack simulation. And what we do is we align to the MITRE attack framework. We build automated adversary emulation to test your security controls in, in a production environment safely and at scale to validate your security control effectiveness and ultimately to, to measure and validate the effectiveness of your total security program. So your people, your processes, and your technology. Um, and really the technology is, you know, technology is a core part of it, but that's the easier part to test. What, what we really reveal are sort of gaps in your, in, your, in your overall process as a security company and your effectiveness. And our goal, we created something called a security optimization platform, is to generate performance data about you know, whether your security controls are detecting and preventing the things that they're supposed to. Um, and, then, and then with that performance data, you can make changes. Uh, you can either identify gaps or capabilities in, in your program. So I'll, I'll tell you more about that, obviously, and, and our strategy. Um, but my background, as, as uh, Rob said and, and Amir said, is I was the chief strategy officer for cyber policy in the Pentagon and working in cybersecurity, uh, which was a surprise career move for me since for about 11 years. Um, I was a counter extremism specialist when I entered the Pentagon in, in 2009. It was really in the middle of the campaigns coming out of 9-11 in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I soon realized that like the internet was being taken apart in cyberspace by, by adversaries and that we didn't have any policy around it. So my boss asked me to write the first DOD cyber strategy in 2010. And then I wrote the second one in 2015. So yeah, that's a bit about my background. It's great to be with you, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Really interesting background there, Jonathan. Amazing. We'll have to over beers get caught more up on uh, uh, on your amazing odyssey. Uh, but yeah, so like uh, so, Attack IQ. Let's you know, let's kind of dig in a little bit more. Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm what I thought I'd do um, for the participants just to level set the conversation and give you about a twelve to fifteen minute. Um, introduction. Obviously, I could talk for a lot longer about what we do, but I, I'm going to pivot over to slides 
um, so that you can you can learn a little bit about us. And and then I'm really so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through sort of how I see the strategic environment today, the nature of risk management, the nature of the threats that we face, and the kinds of problems facing um, folks in the cybersecurity industry overall. Also in the United States, in particular, where we like we're a very wired country, and that's that's our our experience, um, but globally. And then I'll move towards what we what we call um, the practice of threat informed defense, which is don putting on an adversary mindset and, and validating your security controls, as I said a moment ago. And then I'll end with a, the alignment of threat and risk management, because compliance, as someone tweeted yesterday, I really liked it. Compliance does not equal security. So we're going to talk about like how you can measure and improve your overall security effectiveness and your compliance effectiveness. So I'll I'll be pretty short because I know we want to get into questions. Um, so let's let's get started. Okay, so we gather at this moment where under the novel coronavirus, I mean, so the, the cybersecurity threat had been increasing in severity, um, really on, at a constant pace over the last decade. And um, I like to think about, you know, the internet is only 38 years old, I think, 1983, which is the same age as Nicki Minaj, right? This is like an interesting metaphor to hold in your head. The internet is the same age as Nicki Minaj on one hand and Thor on the other. They're about four months apart, I think, in their birthdays. So, like, it's young. Um, it's relatively good looking. Like, these people have game, uh, just like the internet. Like, it's, it's done a ton of good. But it's gone from zero to 4.3 billion users in that 38-year period, which is tremendous, right? Like, there's nothing. That's a remarkable, remarkable transformation in our societies. The United States was for a long time, one of the most wired countries. It still is We're very heavily wired. Singapore, um, Japan, Norway, these, some of these countries are, are around like 97% connectivity. So the internet, the cybersecurity threat has been, has been elevating for, for years. The Director of National Intelligence has for the last five years named it as the number one threat to the nation in the United States, particularly through things like election manipulation, but also data theft. Uh, and destruction, which we're all too familiar of. And, you know, security, security leaders operate in this in a resource constrained environment always. You know, the way I like to think about it is with the Navy, right? Like you have massive expenditures, but you don't have unlimited expenditures. And you have large investments that you have to make. So you have to make strategic choices. So the question is, how do you make those choices when you're budget constrained? And under the coronavirus, as budgets were decreasing in general, that was in particular a salient fact. So um, what we've seen is in the last, at least in the last 11 years since I've been doing cybersecurity is this tremendous increase in spending. You have incredible companies that have come on the market to solve cybersecurity problems, particularly in EDR, right? Endpoint detection and, and it's like companies like CrowdStrike, all of them have come up. They've had incredible success, um, but yet customers are still getting breached. We, we work with Verizon um, for the data breach investigation report every year. And they discovered that 82% of enter, enterprise cybersecurity, uh, enterprise breaches should have been stopped by existing cybersecurity controls, but weren't. But 82% of breaches should have been stopped by existing capabilities, but they were not. And the question is why? It's because they fail. And when cybersecurity fails, it fails silently. It doesn't fail like your car engine. There's no light that comes on. So there's a shift moving away from just spending and having the best cars and the best capabilities and the best people towards saying, we need to have an outcomes driven approach. And that's like, that's simply because things haven't worked in the way that they're supposed to. So I like, um, you know, I, so I've been, in, I was in the Pentagon for seven years and then I had a research grant at Berkeley. And then I joined a company called Illumio and now I'm at Attack IQ. So my, view of cyber threats has, has taken the sort of these three different sectors of, of the public sector, academia, and, and the private sector. And what I've realized is like you have to assume breach. Like this is like this is a this is the industry knows this now, but the interesting thing is it hasn't been adopted. Right? It hasn't been adopted by strategists and agencies and governments. And we see that most recently in the solar winds intrusion. So you have to assume breach and plan for known threats. You have to invest in best in class cyber defense capabilities, and you have to exercise to validate your security program effectiveness. Now, when you look at solar winds, right? Like solar winds and the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which I'm gonna spend a minute talking about, shows how 
this, it, the, the US government after solar winds used the MITRE track framework to describe how the intruder moved laterally throughout the networks that they broke into. So this is like a highly sophisticated multi-year effort to co-opt a supply chain, a key element of the, of the security supply chain through solar winds, and then use an update to break in. In my mind, it's not a question of if, but when an adversary is going to break past. If the last thing was the supply chain intrusion, then there's gonna be something else in the future. So the perimeter is insufficient. And if you assume that they're gonna break through, then you have to invest in what's going on internally inside your data center or your network. And then you have to prepare for them to move laterally. But if you look at what happened in solar winds, like the federal government did not do that. The commerce department, the treasury department, like the intruder just made their way in and moved throughout. It's like to us in the cybersecurity industry, we say, okay, well, you know, you should, you know that this is a problem that's happened over and over again. It happened with OPM in 2015. It happened with Sing Health in 2018. Like, how much, how many more times does the same thing have to happen before you reach the sort of cognitive change? Now, the good news is the federal government recognizes this need for modernization, right? So, like, there's this there's a significant effort to modernize, and concurrent with this realization that you have to modernize your defenses is the realization that you have to test and validate them which means like i like to think about validated zero trust like if you if you build a navy if you build the best navy in the world but it never leaves the port you never exercise your sailors you know imagine like one of the hardest things in the world i've i've seen this happen on an aircraft carrier is having is having a an f-15 pilot land on a moving aircraft carrier imagine if they never exercised that process like they did it once a year right you can't then you can't be expected to land during warfare or during combat or during like a choppy sea. So if you don't exercise your defenses, then you're not going to be prepared, right? So this gets us to like when you think about defense in general and security in general, you don't just think, God, I really wish I could like I really wish that I um that I could build the best wall or I could build the best moat. You have to build these defenses in relation to the tactics that you know the adversary is going to use against you. And when I first started out in cybersecurity in 20, I remember in 2010, um, my boss had injured his back. And um, I, so he was out of the office for two weeks. It was a new job. Um, it was in the office of the undersecretary for policy. And I used to help him with all of his communications. So he received a classified briefing about an intrusion and I, I think I can't say anything else more about it. <clears throat> well, we couldn't talk about it anywhere in the world. It was the it was a massive financial intrusion. Um, and the the only thing that we could do is we could say we knew what the intruder had done on that network. And so in that period of like 2010 to 2013, let's say, the way that we talked about threats was like, we knew what they'd done and we would use the forensic data to describe what the adversary had done. It was really a patchwork of process. It wasn't unified. And there was no real clear way to share information about the adversary. Starting in 2012 or so, I mean, maybe Rob, you, maybe you took a briefing from Lockheed when they did the, the, the kill chain assessment, which would show, this is an early research that showed how the adversary approached a target and the things that they would do. So the kill chain methodology, the MITRE Corporation built off of what Lockheed had done and took intelligence from the intelligence community and research because it's it's in DC, MITRE's in DC, it's a national security, federally funded research and development corporation operating in the public interest. And they took all this intelligence about what we knew about the adversary and they put it into what I like to, it looks like a periodic table, right? Um, there's 12 tactics across the top. And then below all those tactics, you have sub techniques for what the adversary does. And these are things like privilege escalation, uh, lateral movement, like I talked about with solar winds. Um, credential dumping, all these different tactics that we know the adversary does. And this is the first time you're able to say, these are the known tactics and techniques. So it's no longer that you're just like, you're just out there trying to follow a compliance framework, which is what we had in 2012, the NIST cybersecurity framework. It was a list of best practices for how to defend yourself. Now, you know, you can look on one sheet, one single periodic table and say, this is how I need to defend myself. And I know I need to defend myself against the following tactics. And MITRE updates this constantly. They just came out with sub techniques earlier or late last year. They've updated it. It's getting more and more granular all the time. And we work very closely with MITRE. Uh, we published MITRE Attack for Dummies with the MITRE Ingenuity. 
uh, a couple of months ago, um, and we're part of the Center for Threat Informed Defense. So we, we work very closely with them. So, but why do we do it? Why do we do it? And that really is, we if your defenses are not geared towards the most important threats, if they're not looking out at the most important threats, if they're not exercising for the most important threats, they're wasted. And there's this transition away from sort of pure network defense, like I'm gonna meet these basic compliance requirements, these compliance requirements, like an abacus, and towards saying, my security controls have to perform against what we know. They have to perform against these tactics. So we build these scenarios at Attack IQ. We build an automated, we're an automated adversary emulation platform. We build scenarios aligned to these tactics and we run them against your security controls to ensure your effectiveness. Now, today we're talking about aligning uh, threat and risk management. So historically, in, you know, when I was in the Obama administration in 2010, uh, after these intrusions that I talked about earlier, this is like cognitively you can track the, the shift in the American psyche from where it came from in 2010 when we tried to pass a mandate on cybersecurity standards, which was tremendously too aggressive. It was way too aggressive an idea. It was the right idea from the security standpoint to say the world needs to meet this baseline standard. And if you do it, great. And there was talk, there was talk of like giving liability protections and giving tax incentives if you met that standard. It didn't work. Congress killed it. Uh, it was way too intrusive of regulation. Um, instead, we came up with this thing called the NIST cybersecurity framework, which built out of what, drum roll please, NIST 800-53, which is the old NIST compliance framework that all of you have hopefully heard of. Um, uh, so these standards, however, do not necessarily guarantee effectiveness. Like you could spend your entire life trying to say, I'm gonna build these security controls, I'm gonna follow these security controls, but if you haven't geared them, if you haven't tested the NIST 800-53 security controls against known threats, then you cannot report out on how well they're performing. You can simply say, I've done the things you asked me to do, regulator. But now for the first time, if you take the scenarios and the known tactics of attack and exercise your controls under NIST, you can say, last week we were operating at 75% effectiveness against lateral movement or privilege escalation. Um, we ran these tests. We know we can do better. We've made some tinkering. We found out that somebody was on vacation and they hadn't received a, a license to, to, to complete some spending. Like, so they're actually back and we realize this now. So now they've, they've completed, they've completed the license agreement that we needed from an MSSP, for example, and now we're back operating at, at 90%. So you run these tests continuously against your controls. So you can actually validate to auditors, to your board, to the public. You can say, this is how well we're performing. So if, <laughs> If Congress calls you up and says, hey, we think there's another solar winds intrusion coming, um, are you ready for it? You can say, you know what, I, um, I'm in the Department of Agriculture. I ran lateral movement against my infrastructure and the adversary, our scenarios just ran right through our infrastructure completely unencumbered. I need to ask you for $500,000 worth of internal defenses right now, because I know that the adversary just marched through my network like as if the keys to the kingdom were open, which is what happened in December. Like that is literally what happened. So um, real performance data is what is what we're after. Like we generate real performance data about your program performance so that you can then make configuration changes if they have to happen from a tech standpoint. You can make investment decisions. You can brief the people who need to know, who really wanna know, are we good? And you can say, yes, we are good. So um, I, I think that's probably enough to get us started, but like this is where we are in terms of in terms of the threat alignment from a compliant from our compliance standpoint, and this is just one part of the kind of strategic change we're we're trying to affect through a threat informed defense, um, is this alignment? We want to end this. What I like to say, we're ending the strategic drift, the era of strategic drift of just more and more spending by focusing on outcomes. And um, and if you look at like Paul Nakasone, who's the the here, I'll stop sharing because I think I think that's probably enough for now. I can go into product stuff later if you guys want, but um, it's really interesting, like, no, well, I'll pause on that. I'll come back to that in a second. But Paul Nakasone is the director of the National Security Agency and um, the head of US Cyber Command. And I've known him since he was a colonel because we were both there at the beginning of Cyber Command. Um, he was working for Keith Alexander when I was working for Jim Miller. Um, in advance of the 2018 congressional election, he stood up this thing called the Russia Small Group and it brought the National Security Agency together with US Cyber Command 
And the purpose was to share threat intelligence with the operators as quickly as possible. And then they also said, okay, we're gonna talk to the, to the private sector at the same time, because they knew that if they, the, the more granular details they had about how the Russian government was going to try to operate against the electoral infrastructure of the United States, the more quickly they could share it and develop practices like cyber defense practices to blunt the intruder from doing certain things. So at that time, it's really interesting if you look at the history, Microsoft and Facebook are removing hostile Russian actors from their infrastructure on their own. Concurrently, concurrently with the US government through FBI on one hand, CISA, the cybersecurity infrastructure and security agency is hardening a state electoral infrastructure. And then Cyber Command for the first time ever says, we've identified this one actor, the Russian Internet Research Agency, we're gonna remove their access to the internet so that they can't blunt and block. No, so they can't disrupt the electoral infrastructure. So you have these multiple, multiple courses of action being taken, everybody under their own authority, because the Defense Department's the only one who can go out and do something against an adversary legally. But you had the, the private companies operating on their own networks in terms of service. And it was all based around what we knew about the intruder. And that was like, this is how we're going to prepare. This is what we know the intruder's going to do. Now, the trick is like, obviously, there's, an, there's a requirement for the, and disinformation operations are different kinds of operations than MITRE ATT&CK. There's a movement to sort of categorize all the disinformation operations into a similar periodic table like ATT&CK right now. But if you, these frameworks need to be constantly updated. And the thing is like, it's, it's like, um, it's like, like I mean, a metaphor could be poetic verse. It's like, we've cataloged, these are the different ways that people write poetry. This is the different ways. And when someone comes up with a new way, you include that in the catalog. The same thing is true with, with MITRE ATT&CK. Um, and that's why it's such a fundamental foundational thing for us as a company uh, and why we believe so much in threat informed defense. Why don't I stop now? Great, well, uh, very, very, very interesting, Jonathan, good stuff. You know, just a couple of comments, you know, just as a leader in technology, I've often said to the security teams more than once, you know, just assume the breach, it's not a question of if, it's really a question of when. And then you can look at the how, right, in terms of what. So I, I, I really kind of resonate with that. And then, you know, we always talk about the risk profiles, right? How, you know, you can't, you can't solve everything, right? So you're always kind of kind of burning down that list of risks, taking a look at your risks and seeing where you're most vulnerable. But then you've got to figure that out, right? Where are your risks? Mm -hmm. You know, how's that going? Um, another thing you said I thought was really kind of interesting too, just in terms like over the last year, with COVID-19 coming, people sort of saw that, the bad guys sort of saw that as an opportunity. People putting their guards down, people going remote, you know, all of a sudden, you know, IT teams did amazing. You know, just think about like, we dropped, we dropped everything in March and then we just run like crazy to support all these teams, you know, working from home, all of this. And, you know, just, I think it's a hats off to just all how, how the security teams in IT kind of formed together and really had a lot because we didn't hit, I mean, we, some things happened, of, of course, right. But, you know, we, we did get hit all around, but, you know, but we thwarted a lot too. Um, so I think that's also very interesting. You know, one of the things I, I thought maybe you could tease out for us a little bit more, something that I think that you had talked about, um, you know, the attacker's point of view, right. Kind of mm -hmm. thinking about how do, how do you take, how do you take security and move from defense to offense? Okay. So, you know, like sometimes we say like the best offense is a great defense, but the, talk about that, the data and the way attack IQ and, and, you know, kind of walk, when you walk in the bad guy's shoes and you think about all it, like talk about that lateral, you know, like the X, Y, and Z even act, you know, the, the mm -hmm. X being like one way of going, but then Y, and then, and then there's this intangible Z. Can you kind of tease that out a little bit for us and how you guys think about that particular suite of data execution does that make sure. sense yeah i mean i think i think the best answer to your question is probably um purple team operations right mm -hmm. like the way we think about that process ultimately like we're, our, if our goal is defense cyber defense effectiveness and security effectiveness um we believe in continuous testing because we believe that that's how you you create data and you know what's going on inside your organization now traditionally as all of us know like red team testing and red teams are great, like they're sexy, they're cool. Like they were the neatest people I worked with in the national security community, they still are, because they're like, they're hungry for like, what's, you know, what's the, they, they, they like to look at the adversary and think about it. 
but red teams test like once a year, if at all, right? Like the defense department's weapons programs, as Mike Gilmore said in 2015, are, are totally vulnerable. Our red teams would test once a year and they would reveal these deep vulnerabilities. And then you wouldn't hear from them for like another year. It's like, hey, guess what? It's another year, you're still really vulnerable. And, and red teams, however, they, they only, because they're human run, and this is not a knock against red teams, it's just the way we've done business. Um, they could only test a small segment of assets at a time, right? Like 10 to 15% of an asset. And it's only a point in time thing. So they can't cover all the controls. They can't validate, they can't search, like look across the infrastructure where all the security controls could be because they don't have time. Their purpose is to, to break in. Um, and so, so it needs to be more constant, but more importantly, there needs to be an alignment with the defenders and red team testers at the same time. Um, I think there's like, there's a, there's a hesitation to do that, Rob, I think, because like blue team folks are like, oh, like I'm, I'm, I'm being, it's another pop quiz. Like they're, yeah. they're going to find out how I'm failing and leaders have to create this culture to say, it's not about failure. It's about improvement. And like, we know that failure is happening all the time. You have to improve, particularly if you take the assumed breach narrative. Interesting. So how, so if you if you think about then like this continuous testing like how do these teams get better and better and better right so how in your from your point of view and in, in, in a kind in your in the company that your you guys are kind of fast really kind of defining a market like you're defining something yeah. let's say um, how is that continuous testing you know sort of change like what pen testing is like how do you, how do you kind of how do these teams like constantly move right what does that look like so the really interesting thing that I found as I've talked to senior leaders and major global organizations and also in the government um, is that folks, like I, I'm operating in this company, I've, I believe in it, but it's really interesting when you meet someone who's incredibly smart in a large organization who thinks about the problem in the exact same way you do, and neither of you have ever talked to each other before about it. Like you've, I've, so like automation is the, is the, is the word automation is the word that people want. They want, they want visibility and Neuberger, who's the white house deputy national security advisor for cyber. It's an old friend of mine said, I want, we need visibility into our cybersecurity effectiveness. We need visibility into how things perform when we don't have visibility. And what she's talking about, she says visibility. She says, I want to see the threat. And I want to know how well we perform against it. Mm -hmm. And like that, that really is sort of the first like one fundamental aspect of it is like, you need to see the threat. We need to know how we perform against it. And that's the story is very simple. And once you have, once you're running these continuous tests, I like to think about it like training for a half marathon. Like I, I've been, I'm not, I'm at the least fit I've been right now in two years because of the virus and homeschooling, right? Just like, you look good just for the record. Thanks. Yeah. That's only because you're seeing what I want. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I'm the least fit I've been like my, my um, resting heart rate right before the um, the pandemic was at 1.49, which is really, really good. And it was 53 and I was still proud of it. Now it's gone up to 65. And I know why. I'm not running 25 miles a week. I'm not in the gym for an hour every day. I'm just not. And and there are reasons that I won't get into for why that is, but we can all imagine, right? <laughs> it's like coronavirus. But I wouldn't ask myself tomorrow to run 10 miles and, and win a marathon, or in my case, not have a heart attack. Like these are not demands I would place on myself. However, after three months of, of like smart exercise and training, I'd, I'd, I'd be in, I'd, my heart rate would drop, I know, and I'd be able to make different improvements to my performance. The same exact thing is true for a security program. Like if you test yourself once a year, unless you've been training, unless you have someone who's watching you and saying train, 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 but you can't because you, you can't train without some level of automation because of the proliferation of security controls. So you need to train with, in an automated fashion to generate performance data and you need to do it constantly. And then after two years, like if you still don't have insight in, or after, let's say after like even a shorter period of time, if you're not gaining increased insights and seeing increases in effectiveness after like, I don't know, a month or two months, like you, something is wrong. Like something is, there's something fundamentally wrong in your management structure. Um, somebody's not giving you data. Somebody's not doing what they're supposed to be doing because you should start to see, you should gain granular data very quickly and you should be able to identify what's working and what's not. 
So the, the, an automated platform will test whether something is detected and prevented. Mm -hmm. If it's not, then you need to start asking why. And that involves the people and process part. Yeah. So one of the, one of the things that kind of surprised, like it, it's, you know, that I love the idea and the metaphor of, of the half marathon and running. You know, we sometimes, we have a lot of predictability in IT and in security in, in general. We kind of have a line of sight to things, but there are times yeah. that things just hit us, right? That, that because we can't talk about it, you're a publicly traded company, here's an example. So a publicly traded company, we're about ready to do some big M&A. Right, all of a sudden, like we're going to inherit this company. We're going to inherit whatever lowest common denominator they have. We've kind of done our work. What have they done on theirs? How are you guys thinking about like this kind of a platform assisting the security teams around M and A? You know, is that is that a thing for you guys? Is that yes? There's been a lot of money, like by the, there's there's a lot of money been sitting on the side during the COVID year, right? We're seeing yeah. a lot of action right now. There's a lot of growth in the industry. There's a lot of roll ups. A lot of international companies now coming in, you know, and how are you guys thinking about that? So this is like, this is actually my favorite example. I don't know if you and I talked about this in our prep call. I can't, I can't, I don't remember, honestly, but this is my, we'll just go live this is, yeah, this is my favorite example. And like, this is like the light bulb really went off for me. I'm going to bring up one slide quickly here. If yeah. that's cool with you guys. So this is like a bit of an eye chart but it's full of good and useful data. So the M&A example, we, we actually have it in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, this is the sort of evolution of security optimization as we see it, if you're running a continuous security control validation process, we've identified at least 26 ways that you can improve your program performance, which means improve business outcomes. And M&A is the best example actually. Um, Cause I get security operations to defend your infrastructure against the Russian government, that's easy. Now an M&A example, like, this is where you begin to see the, the benefits. Cause like we actually have a customer who did this and who used us and who thought about using us in this way. Um, you're a large uh, international organization and you want to acquire a subsidiary. It's to your exact point, Rob, you, you don't know what their, the nature of their infrastructure is. You're worried that as you do the integration, it's yeah. going to in introduce tremendous vulnerabilities into your platform, into your entire infrastructure that you and your team have worked for hours and hours and years and like to make secure. Like, why would you do that to yourself? You can run, you can actually, there's two parts. One, like it's easy to do to like run the platform against their infrastructure to find the vulnerabilities and say, listen, or not the vulnerabilities, the gaps in their defenses and, and the weaknesses and the control failures. The more important thing is you can then say as a part of the deal, as a part of us negotiating this deal with you, you need to fix these, fix these risks that we've identified, fix these program control failures, because we don't want, we don't want you to be anywhere near us until you've done this. So we're going to ask you to actually pay for it yourself. You could say that, or you could say, we're going to give you $250,000 to invest in a new MSSP after, you know, depending on what the finding is, you could, you could take it depending on how you want to structure the deal. You can use what you learn about their performance to bake certain aspects into it. Um, so I think this is actually a beautiful, a beautiful example of how an automated control security validation platform can help you achieve better business outcomes. Now, a couple others um, for the cyber insurance market, right? It's like uh, if you're if you're the insuree and you want to prove to your insurance provider that you're meeting the cybersecurity requirements that they've set out through whatever whatever standard they're choosing. Let's say they're using NIST 800 or they could be using PCI, um, the P PCI DSS, you can, you can prove how well your controls perform under that compliance framework. So you're not actually showing, you're not just like waving your hand as a questionnaire, you're actually showing effectiveness. So this is, I, I, there's tons and tons of different models, but I, in the interest of time, I don't want to just run off. Yeah, no, that's awesome. You know, so I think it's really, again, for the audience here, if you are looking at m and so, and you're, and you're really trying to kind of compare, find the gaps, you guys have an offering that really will help, help be helpful with that. I mean, I know that's come up with a couple of companies that I advise, and I think it's great to kind of know about it. Um, yeah. just real quick, we have one, one question from the audience, I think is really interesting. It talked about the purple team. So how does, how does purple team kind of get accepted by blue team? Like how do these teams like interrupt? That's something I actually read, written down too. We talked about the red team, purple team. What about blue team? What about how these guys all kind of ratchet together? Any quick thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it, the, the one really, po there's a ton of really positive aspects, obviously, about, about the benefits of performance data, but it gets rid of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how well you're doing. You can see the results of your, of your, of your work, right? Like, how well am I, how well are my controls performing? Like, I, it should give you a certain amount of satisfaction to say, I'm elevating my program. I'm finding gaps. And this is a blue team job. Like, yeah. Red is telling me, Red is telling me, or the, 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 the automated platform or my red team is telling me where the gaps are and I see them and I'm putting on this mindset. So I'm no longer outsourcing all the gap thinking to them. Like I'm learning from them, right? I'm, I'm benefiting. I'm not becoming a red teamer, but I'm, I see the gaps. Now you can say like, I'm empowered to make data-driven decisions. I can now make like very, I have robust data-driven decisions about threats. And, the, and everyone in the organization is looking at threats the same way. It's like, you can talk to the auditors, you can talk to your compliance team, you can talk to the architecture team, you can talk to the security operations team, you can talk to the CISO, you can talk to the CEO, like everyone is thinking about threat behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have one way to do it. And then you can say, you know, look, uh, and, and your threat stream is updated, like MITRE does this. This is something that I first, when I first learned about it, I was like, well, what, what if they just come up with some new method of intrusion? It's like there aren't actually that many new methods of doing something once they get inside, right? There aren't. There may be novel methods, but we've known about supply chain risk for 10 years. I was on a supply chain working group in 2011 trying to prepare for this exact kind of thing. So it, it decreases ambiguity for Blue. And that I think is very powerful for them. Um, and it empowers them to make better decisions. Yeah. Yeah, very helpful. Uh, you know, like uh, we're nearing a little bit of uh, the end here. Uh, one more question, and then I'll toss it back over to you to give us a wrap up, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. You know, one of the things that we're talking about, even today, I was talking with a, a team of operational people and, and a head of security. I've noted that a lot of teams just don't incorporate security in the product development life cycle or system or software development life cycle. And, and you know, kind of in that continuous improvement. And, any thoughts about how? You guys are kind of thinking about that because, you know, just if, if we're always thinking about security at the end or you guys go do that or you're, you're keep us out of problems and we're not really incorporated in the life cycle, it seems like we're missing something here. Yeah, I mean, that's that that is a key, a key part of it. We have a use case for for software development life cycle testing. Um, and I think that like within a quality assurance within the quality assurance process, if you're in DevOps, like you can once you have a prototype or something that you think is like working well, you can run the platform against it to discover, to discover like how well the, the, the software performs against the security controls that, that, and how they need to relate. You can do that for sure. Um, it, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, and that's something that we wanna do is like build in that kind of quality assurance testing early on in a new platform. And another thing on the customer side, so here's an interesting, here's an interesting way the story can play out at, at a, at a like I want to ultimately get to a place where it's scanning code early. So you actually, it scans code. It's, it's not quite there yet, as far as I understand it. And I've asked for this a little bit, but that's like extremely advanced AI. And we do have, um, I'll tell you in a little, in a little bit about some of our advanced capabilities, but um, imagine if you're like, we can, if you're a law firm, this is a good example. You're a law firm and you're very dependent on, like, as everybody, like third party applications for some of your most critical business operations. Let's say you have a document storage or a document management system that you're bringing into your enterprise. You can use the platform to test how that, that application, like what the levels of risk that it would introduce once it's embedded. Uh, and then you can put pressure on the software developers to say, Hey, you sold me this thing and it made me more vulnerable. It doesn't inter it doesn't integrate with my security. Or like there are these gaps in, in the security that, that your your platform has introduced. You can then sort of drive down the security risk in the same way that the regulators do for you onto the third party providers because you're running an automated platform against them and you're saying, listen, this just isn't working. Another example is MSSPs. Like if you're doing an MSSP proof of concept. If you're trying to decide between three different MSSPs, you can run the platform against them to say, oh, you're not meeting the requirements. Like you're simply, you know, the commercial off the shelf capabilities that you're looking at, like we're often not like a ton of customers have, have chosen to use us as full-time customers 
because they've used us in a, in a, in a POC against a, against a series of vendors to say, how well is the vendor performing on, on my network? Yeah. And like we win over 90% of the time, if and when like, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. All right, well, we're just um, coming right to the end. Any closing comments? Uh... Sure. You know, when I joined this company, um, I had like, I'd come out as sort of, I'd come out as, as a big strategist in the Defense Department, sort of setting national missions for the country, right? Like we had this mission called Defend the Nation. It's now called uh, Persistent Engagement or uh, Defend Forward in the Defense Department. It's like, the plan was like, if an, if an attacker, you know, comes out the country in some way, and we were very focused on the Russian government in 2015 from a critical infrastructure standpoint, because it was like they were deploying black energy onto our electric grid. Right. And the military would then sort of have to blunt and disrupt the adversary. And I, there were like strategic choices in my head where I was like, that's a really hard mission. It's an incredibly hard mission to do for the defense department. And they say in ballistic missile defense, if a missile's coming in and you're trying to hit it, it's like hitting a, it's like hitting a pitchfork in space with a needle, right? Cyber is even harder because they can hide. So my default position, looking at the cyber, the cyber defense failures in the 2015 timeframe was to focus on resilience, like backup capabilities. And like, I, I was really focused on being able to operate. You have to be able to operate in a degraded cyber environment. I didn't know anything. It had never occurred to me to sort of run an automated adversary emulation. This was a new idea for me um, in like two years ago, probably is when I first learned about it. And it is the first time I'm, I'm actually able to argue without feeling like I'm like, I can now argue with honesty that cybersecurity investments can work because you know that you're testing them against the proof that we see in the world. And that has made me like tremendously confident in our ability as a country within the United States in particular to solve these incredibly hard problems. Because we know that not only do we need to modernize, that's like an easy argument to make. Everybody needs to modernize their infrastructure if you're not up and running with, with the best in class cyber defense capabilities. But you need to modernize it because we know it works. And, yeah. and if, you, if you test it constantly, you know that you can improve your effectiveness. Now, if like in, you know, if technology changes all the time and in 10 years, if someone comes up with some new way of attacking us, we're gonna have to find new ways to validate our effectiveness against it. Right. So we keep pace. The last thing I'll say on this is like, we place a tremendous premium on partnering with our, with our, with our partners in the defense community. We have a three P strategy. We've got our platform, which I've talked a lot about, our partnerships of threat and informed defense. We educate the public for free through Attack IQ Academy on a lot of the concepts I've talked about. So if anyone's interested, there are Academy courses. And then the third is our partnerships, right? Like the platform, practice and partnerships. And we, we partner with the cybersecurity industry very closely. And we've just, there's been this tremendous investment in artificial intelligence and machine learning based cyber defense technologies. We are, our platform is the first one built from the ground up to test AI and ML defense technologies through a multi-stage emulation. So we have to keep up with the industry and we have to emulate the adversary as best we can. And it's like, it's just super exciting. It's like one of the coolest jobs ever. I'm sure a lot of people say that though. We can, I can certainly tell your enthusiasm. It's, uh, it's really been great to hear from you today and learn more about Attack IQ and uh, also just your amazing journey uh, to get here. Um, Thanks. But I, I think, you know, like you and I could go on and on like we did the last time we talked on and on about this. I'm sure uh, I think our, our uh, attendees today would, would love it, love to be more interactive. We're getting a lot of great questions, you know, that are still coming up and I'll, um, I'll note them here, you know, especially like keeping up with best, best practices, but I think you mentioned earlier here. But um, it would invite everybody. Uh, you've been very accessible on LinkedIn. I am too. So uh, if you do have uh, any other questions, I invite the audience here to reach out to Jonathan. Uh, yeah, please. And um, ask away. And, and certainly we'll, we'll keep an eye on how you guys progress the, the company and, and the platform. I'm super impressed and uh, I've already started to dig in myself and some of the companies I work with. So, um, yeah, super excited to stay in touch. Uh, again, thank everybody for attending today. And, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll continue, I think, to bring these kinds of, uh, of, of uh, tools and capabilities, I think, to the market, right, Jonathan, to help our, our, uh, 
our friends and colleagues here to work the bad guys. So thank you again for, for putting this on today. TAC IQ and Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, again, a pleasure to meet with you and thanks to SIG USA for being the glue to put all this together. So uh, thanks, yeah, thank you all for joining, have a safe and secure day. Be well, everyone. Take care. Thanks again.